Boom. Tonight we follow up with the second power class. And this class is the healing power class on the law of sacrifice. Blessings and much love and um, to everyone at Anointed Life Mentorship International. <sighs> we are falling into the we're gonna get serious tonight. We're gonna get serious tonight. She shout out to Holy Sister Sandra Pop. Join us in the comment section. Blessings and much love, Holy Sister. Awesome to see you here. Huge shout out to Holy Sister Shannon Rarig. Blessings and much love. Awesome to see you here as well. Yeah. All right, will you all just give me a sound check there, please? Sound check, sound check. Can you all hear me loud and clear? I, am I being heard distant? In the distance or, or am I heard loud and clear? Sound check, sound check. Let's give me another sound check. So tonight, we are actually proceeding into the follow-up from last night. Last night, we actually speak, spoke about the posture of power. And I'm certain that I met many people in particular that were here, and even those who saw it after, may not have been aware as to how straightforward scriptures, the scriptures are. All right, perfect sound. Thank you very much, Holy Sister Sandra. Blessings, much love. And so tonight we are actually going to proceed into justification. We spoke, we spoke last night and we identified that in most cases, fear is as a result of a lack of understanding, a lack of justification for your stance. And tonight, the objective here tonight is to eliminate the reason for fear and for you to actually understand the logic behind why you should be healed. And once that happens, naturally, you feel strength. You feel indignation when it is being when it is being contradicted or someone or something is trying to invalidate it and then you stand in you put your faith into action shout out to holy sister rashida kai kur blessings much love holy sister shout out to holy sister tanya woodkey blessings and much love holy sister All right so as you're coming in please feel free to leave your name in the comment section where you're coming from name and location let's see let's see where you are blessings and much love to holy sister monica poynton uh -huh. and of course our holy brother norman pigeon blessings and much love holy sister grace the amiral blessings and much love Rish well, just seeing the night from holy sister rashida nice uh, let us know where you are your location where you're coming from I'd love, to, I'd love to know where you are coming from. Let's see where where, where the, the knowledge of Christ is going. Alright. Um, blessings and much love to Holy Sister Patty Sutton is in the house. Another master mentor of the International Institute of Dermatology. Alright. The other is Holy Sister Tonya. Holy Sister Pauline Blessing. Blessings and much love, Holy Sister. Let us know where you're coming from. Holy Sister Grace says she's coming from Rhode Island. Blessings and much love, Holy Sister. Nice, nice. So we're coming in. If you know anyone in particular, anyone particularly, that you know would benefit from this, this segment here tonight, Please tag them in the comment section if they are a member of this group. And of course, if they are not members of this group, send them a group invite and we will let them in as they come in. Alright? Holy Brother Israel John Masse, blessings and much love. Let us know where you're coming from. Let's see where the knowledge of Christ is going. Let's see, let's see where the knowledge of Christ is going. Nice. So, having said that, 
we how, how many of us are ready to start if you're ready to start type let's go in the comment section let's go let's go maryland in the house blessings and much love Ble maryland in the united states mm -hmm. blessings and much love in the north america Brother, uh, who you rather Israel John my sisters I'm from India but now in Canada blessings 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 let's go let's go all right <laughs> I see the let's go is coming in nice that is the spirit remember the message I said remember what you spoke about yesterday that's the spirit that's the disposition nice now before we actually get into Tonight I'm going to be taking it nice and slow again so that everybody follows just as I did last night and before we actually continue continue on with the idea on understanding what the law of sacrifice is it's very important that I actually touch a, touch a particular component that the understanding of the law of sacrifice is going to help I want to start with a little scenario. Yeah? Let's say, for example, you are on the... Somebody actually, tell, somebody actually shows you a long road, long, straight road. All right? We're beginning here, all right? So, we're getting started. So, pay attention to the first... The first, the, the, the first, the first, the um, first, the first analogy. Here. So we start you off. You're heading on this long road, and while it, while you're heading on this long road, somebody stops you on the road, and they say, "Hey, if you get to the end of this road, if you get to that point on the road, right on the mountain." As a matter of fact, you see, you see a checkpoint on the mountain. Then you see a next, a next checkpoint on the mountain. Nice, visible checkpoint. Somebody tells you you get down there. You get down on that road. When you reach to the bottom, you will be given. Huge shout out to Holy Sister, to Holy Brother Leventi Tilika. Blessings and much love. Coming in from Romania. Yeah. Shout out, shout out to Romania. So you're heading on this long road. And while you're on the long road, somebody tells you. At the bottom of that long road is unlimited blessings. Right? When we say unlimited blessings, we mean as, as much as you desire. Unlimited blessings. And you see the next checkpoint on the mountain? On the top of the mountain is eternal life. You will never die. And you take a look at this mountain. You take a look at this mountain. Shout out to Holy Brother Norman. Blessings much love. Yeah, you take a look at this mountain. You see the bottom of the mountain. You see at the bottom of the mountain. You see unlimited blessings. On, on the next checkpoint on the mountain saying, Eternal life, you're not going to die. And you don't have a vehicle. So you're running. Now, why is you're running, you're heading down this mountain, you're heading towards this mountain. Something happened, something blew across the road, and you fell down. You fell down, and you feel like your knee kind of grazed the, grazed the, the asphalt on the road. And it's a little painful. Would you continue? Yes or no? Write in the comment section. Would you continue? Right? Yes or no in the comment section. This is a practical question. Would you continue? Blessings and much love to Holy Sister Tammy. Awesome to see you, Holy Sister. It's been a long time. I trust it all as well. Blessings and much love. Alright, so we've seen th three yeses already. Right? Get up and go. Get up and go. Alright. <laughs> so, so, you've got up. 
and you start to go again. Start to run. And somewhere along the line, you reach a certain road, and you see a lion jump out in the road. And you start to... Yes. So you, you, you're running, and the lion jump out in the road, and you start to wrestle the lion. Right? And the lion... Lion's strong, and you demonstrate, and you're strong as you holding this lion, and you just like Samson, you hold on to this lion, and you start to pull this lion jaw. But the lion grab it, grab it, grab, grab, grab your tie, and sink, sink, sink its its teeth in into your tie. And then you hold it on, and, you, and then you hold on to the, to the mouth, and eventually you do so, cack, and it break, break the lion jaw. Now for long there, cack, and you watch, you watch the wound in your thigh would you continue yes or no type it in the comment section again would you continue towards the first checkpoint that you see in unlimited blessings and the next checkpoint to turn alive would you continue going yes how many are saying yes i jump over the line like superman that is what we say <laughs> right and you're heading across there Nice. So, so far, your knee bruised and you have two teeth on the lion sunk into your thigh. And you're running. Right? But, and in your mind, you think, remember, in your mind, you're watching, you're watching that, that, that you're, you're watching that, um, that, so in your mind, you're watching the checkpoint, the checkpoint, unlimited blessings, and you're watching the next one for eternal life. You're not going to die. Right? You're not going to die. So if you're not going to die, but our wound is nothing. So you keep running. Because you know if you reach there, all of that is nothing. It worth it. Yeah? Keep running. And whilst you're running, you pass a military base. And a sniper was on top of a tall building. Sniper seal. Pow! And hit you in your knee. Just above your knee. Pow! Shot in your leg. You fall down. And you get up. And you watch that day again. You say, nah, you had to get there. So you get up. And you start to move as best as you could. As best as you could. Would you continue? Yes or no? Write in the comment section. Would you continue? Unlimited blessings. Eternal life. You're not going to die. Would you continue, yes or no? Yeah? You keep running. Anybody else? Yes. Keep limping forward. My spirit says, yes, exactly. Never, <laughs> never give up. Keep it rolling. Right? You keep running. Shout out to Holy Brother Chris Borden Kutcher. Boom. Blessings and much love, Holy Brother. So you keep running. And whilst, and whilst you're there, for some reason, now this, I, I know there's a lot, of, a lot of incidents taking place here, right? For some reason, you're running and you you are so focused. You so focused on what you're doing. You didn't realize there's a piece of cactus in the road, and you step on the cactus, and somebody, the 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 the, 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 the cactus, ran up into your feet. In into in, in let's say it, it actually ran up into your foot. You sit down. You sit now. You stop and you watch it and you pull that out. Would you keep going? Yes or no? Would you keep going? Yes or no? Right in the comment section. I want everybody responding. Would you keep going? And all of this going on. You're feeling pain. Would you keep going? Even if you're feeling pain, would you keep going? Yes or no? Yes. See that? You see that right there? Welcome to what it means.
to walk in the spirit. What you just mentioned, what you just did there, was actually allowed you the will of the spirit. The will of the spirit maintain control and maintain priority over your feelings. Welcome to what it means to walk in the spirit. Your will remain priority above your feelings. If that just click, say spirit in the comment section, right? Spirit. Exactly what I just did there with you is exactly why soldiers win wars. Because in their training, what they do is that they push them to the end of their training. They push them to the end of their training or to the end of the physical capability. And you know what happens after that? They begin to do it from the spirit. What does that mean? They begin to do it from pure will. They begin to do it by will. Their body saying no, but their will says yes. And by that, they keep doing it. And sometimes the body is not even able but the will is filling the body with energy and life to be able to do it. Is this making sense? Will. Now, in your Bible, this is exactly how you walk in the Spirit. You grab a promise and you walk on that. You will. Your desire is to fulfill the promise. Your desire is to fulfill what God said. And right now, with regards to sickness, that is basically what you need to do. Most of you have been experiencing sickness for a long time because you allow your feelings to, over, to be on top of the will. And so let's take the scenario of you experiencing these injuries as sickness and you experience it and instead of actually remembering bringing to mind that where Yeshua strives you're healed and walking healed you allow your feelings above your will and because you feel like this then you begin to allow your will to actually be subject to your feelings and then your will has accepted the fact that you are sick and you begin to conform to a sick life is this making sense is this making sense type sense because once this begins to become understood what we are about to do here tonight is to put you in the correct place so that you tonight could by the spirit get up and see your body healed tonight not tomorrow tonight which means notice in the Bible it does not see that you walk by senses sight you walk by faith to walk by faith is exactly what you were doing on that road you have the faith that you're going to arrive and because of faith you keep moving because at the bottom of that road to to gain the prize as the apostle paul put it at the bottom of that road you gain unlimited blessings and on top of the mountain you have no dying what you would just what I just walk you through there is what it means to walk in faith and to not allow your physical feelings, the feelings of your senses, the data given to you by your senses.
by your physical senses to override your will. Because guess what? The promises of God operate from your will. The power of the Holy Spirit operates from your will. This is why Paul says, set your affections on things above. Because if your affections are there, you will always operate with a strong and courageous will. Because that up there is the truth. Not what your five senses are actually experiencing. If that makes sense, type sense. Write, write sense again in the comment section. Type real sense. Real sense. <laughs> now, for most of us, particularly, what happens is that your will is not educated sufficiently. That's what's going on with you. Your will is not educated sufficiently. And I use, I, I use this as an example yes, from in a previous session, actually, where I actually use, if someone, for those of you here who are here and understand what it means to live in a, in a democratic society, if you hear anyone, especially someone who is an authority, communicate to you that you do not have the freedom or the right to have your own religion or the right or the freedom of speech, what would you do? What would be your response? And because most of you have heard about your constitutional rights for a long time, it doesn't matter what you hear. What you do is that you sit down and you refresh what it says. Or you might call someone and say, hey, now, don't we not have the right of freedom, freedom of speech, freedom of religion? So what is this person speaking about? I say no. That is not going to be like that. No. And what you do, despite what you hear, your will pushes you forward. And that will, you continue to rehearse what is true. And when you rehearse what is true, you build more strength you get courageous and you stand and you say no i have the right that is what we're doing here tonight that will the only reason why your will is so weak over your emotions is because you have not justified why healing is yours why you should be healed just like why you should have a right to, f to freedom of um, a freedom of the right to have speech, a right the right to have your own religion, the right to speak freely. See that right is actually what gives you strength. You sit down there and you're going it over until your wills. You may not feel nice about what is being said. You may you may see things that is not good, but your will which is you walking from the spirit, functioning from the spirit there now. The will, the spirit. And you stand and you say no, because you have faith of results. If that is registered in your mind, type faith. So what we are about to do here tonight since I, before I even move on did not did it not say didn't the apostle paul says that it is god who is in you to will and to work which means god is in your will not in what you feel god is in your will if god it is if it is god in you to will and to work there's a couplet. For those of you who do not know what a couplet is, this is a grammatic, a, a literary tool in your Bible. In your Bible, 
from the ancient Israelites, when King James translated it, they translated it with the parallelisms. And very frequently in your Bible, for those of you who have been here before, you know about this already. For those of you who are hearing this for the first time, a lot of the usage of and in your Bible is not used as a conjunction to link two things together. It's used as a parallel link. It's called a couplet. So if it is God that is in you to will and to work, to will and to work, that means that's a parallel. That means your will is doing the work. Your will is the work. Your will is the work of the power. Your will works the power. The power is flowing through your will. How many of us hearing this for the first time? Type first time. Type first time. Now, this thing is so simple, it just takes some good, some good westernized theology to complicate the matter. <laughs> Right? You're going to let's know. Let me, let me read it for, for, for you from from the New Testament. All right, somebody in particular, just that just type. Just type that, um, just add that verse there for me, please, because I'm actually recording from my phone, so I can't go on the phone to do that. Just locate that verse. For it is God that is in you to will and to work. It is God that is in you to will and to work. Pull up that verse and, 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 and post it in the comment section for me, please. Somebody says, not sure I'm understanding. So let's just recap what we just said. That scenario that I gave you, going towards the, 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 the first checkpoint, which is unlimited blessings, and then the second checkpoint, which is to immortal life, immortality, you're not going to die. That scenario that I just gave you, where you were experiencing pain, experiencing injuries, and you kept going, what you were doing is that you were driven by what the person said you're driven by it and that being driven there is you is a very good example of you have strengthened your will to get there and that is what the scriptures mean when it says walk in the spirit or the couplets all right so the scripture verse that we're speaking about in the bible thank you very much leventi Philippians chapter 2, verse 13. Alright? I have it. I have, I have Philippians 2 here, but I can't post it from here today anyway. So thank you there for thank you very much for posting that error. So in the scriptures, in the Bible, one of the literary tools that is used in the Bible is something called couplets. The Bible is not written in the in the in the structure of your English language where you, use, where you see everything in chronological order. That's called step logic. Step logic, step logic is the logic that, that requires that everything that you are being told is arranged in chronological sequence so that you can understand the progression. The Bible is written in blocked logic, which means it's written with a lot of parallelisms. Parallelisms means that what, what is said at first the next line is just another way of saying what the first line says. And very, very frequently in your Bible, this is not taught in Western Christianity, but the word and in your Bible is very frequently not used as a conjunction or as an aggregate, meaning we say fork and spoon, knife and fork, plate and cup. And those, those are two things. That's be using it as an aggregate. In the Bible, the word and is very commonly used 
as a couplet link or as a parallel link meaning that when you see it as it is written here for it is God which work it in you both to will and to do his good pleasure it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good and to work his good pleasure Right? For it is God which work it in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So, it says both to will and to do. And in that context, what you're looking at there is that the will, that is where the will, which is where the word flows from. The word is driven, the word drives the will. You see the word, and you, your word drives the will. And Jesus also very commonly referred to the word of the Father, with the works of the Father. Which means when you will what God says, you are, it, if it is God who is in you, to work, which work it in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure, which is also written to will and to work. Yeah? To will and to work. It actually shows that to will and to work go hand in hand. And therefore, your will causes you to take action. And that will is the working of the power of God. As I said, it takes some good Western theology to take that and complicate that to high mountains. <laughs> now, as I said, when I use the scenario of constitutional rights, your will is educated with regards to what your rights are. And so whenever there is confrontation or contradiction or someone begins to invalidate your right to freedom, to, to, your, your right to, to free speech or your right to choose your own religion, what you experience is that you begin to stand. And if you don't feel stand immediately, what you do is that you go and you rehearse what the truth is and that causes your will to be strong and then you rise you become courageous walking in the spirit is no different walking in the spirit is no different if this makes sense type makes sense now having said that just as you would go and recite because you have a fair understanding as to what your rights are. Most persons feel weak with regards to doing what the scripture said yesterday, to be strong, to be fearless, to smite the darkness. You, feel, you don't feel much will because the truth of the matter is most of you here have actually been educated about Jesus through what we call blind faith. Could, it, could anybody, you don't have to actually put me, just put I in the comment section. Just put one letter, I. How many of us can actually attest to the fact that you were taught Jesus and asked to actually blindly have faith in Jesus? You didn't, you were not really taught why you should have faith in Jesus. Just put I in the comment section. Just one letter. Right? This is not about trying to actually bring condemnation. But you need to identify it. Because if you don't, you're going to continue to have a will that is not strong. You're going to identify it and then make a decision tonight to change that. You were taught that Jesus is Lord, have faith in him. You don't know why. If somebody actually told you that what that man said on the, on the television about your freedom, your rights, your freedom is a lie, and you didn't have any understanding of, a, of the presence of a constitution, you would also, the same weakness that you have right now, to smite the darkness and to smite the devil, to smite the sickness, the disease, and infirmity, to smite the death. The same weakness that you have there, the same weakness you would hear, the same weakness that you would experience if you hear this person say, you have no more right to have a religion, you have no right to freedom of speech. Sorry, you have no right to free speech. You, have, you no longer have that liberty. 
if you did not have the knowledge of our constitution and how that constitution works, you would have sat down there and said, wow, really? And you start to cry. Because daddy just, take away, just, just took away your privileges. Do you see why? Is everybody now seeing why? Understanding what you are standing up with is important. If you see that type understanding, third rule, type understanding. So now comes the question. Okay, the scripture says that if death is given to my hands, because Jesus have the keys and he gives you the keys too, if it's given to your hands, smite it. Let's now see why you have the right to smite that. You ready? Type ready. Let's go. <laughs> Let's go. Type ready. Let's go. Tonight we bring that foolishness to an end. Tonight we put you in a position where you could smite that tonight. Arise and walk just like you were heading down that, high, that, that, that highway. Yeah? Just like you were heading down that highway. And no matter what, what that person told you, set your will like flint that is how you walk in the spirit tonight you get up with the understanding of what we're talking about here with that will you get up and you just take a walk on that and you will actually see healing on your body if you still need healing now let's put something into perspective here remember we said before that when God created man to the ancient priests and prophets and the apostles, even for Jesus, they understood that when God created man, what God did was, as you see in the Genesis narrative, the garden was created in the spirit. And then that garden was then breathed into the man. And that man became Yahweh Elohim, Yahweh Adam. And Yahweh Adam creates the garden or creates heaven and earth. You know, we covered yesterday, heaven and earth reproduces heaven and earth. So for him to create heaven and earth, he had to be heaven and earth. And for you to be heaven and earth, the father had to be heaven and earth too. And if the garden is called Eden, then he has to be Eden. And if he's Eden, then by the law of the garden, which is every spirit reproduces after its own kind, the father had to be Eden too. So let's say that one more time. So when you just say, please repeat. Let's play that one more time. We know, according to the ancient Israelites, that the interpretation of the Garden of Eden in our Western culture is totally out of the context of the Bible. If you read the text according to the ancient Israelites, the ancient priests, chapter 1 to chapter 2 verse 3 represents God creating the Garden in seven days. And those seven days were not literal seven days, nor was it about the creation of the cosmos. We also said yesterday that in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. It's not about time, but according to how the Bible was structured, if you want to follow this, listen to the session from yesterday, or how the Bible is structured, we see that King Solomon, who is using the wisdom or the mindset of the man in the garden, which is called the wisdom of Yahweh, he gives insight to show you that in the beginning, is, is paralleled with wisdom in his literature. Wisdom is the principal thing, meaning wisdom is the beginning. The same barashit in the beginning, wisdom is barashit, is the beginning. So therefore, according to Jesus' understanding of the God narrative, it was not about the creation of the cosmos. Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 should read, for your understanding, in wisdom, Elohim created you, heaven and earth. 
And then we see the narrative rolls out in the seven days. And then chapter 2 starts to say that this is the history and the day that heaven and earth was created before anything was in the earth. Which means what is mentioned in chapter 1 was not physical. It was God creating that in the spirit, in mind, creating the will. And that is then breathed into the man. And man is the one that begins to bring that into manifestation on the earth. Hence Jesus' prayer, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. Thy will. Will again. <laughs> on earth as it is in heaven. Because the garden was the template of heaven in the man. If everybody is following that, type follow. Thy will be done. Hmm. <laughs> See, you're hearing these things, but nobody connected dots for you. So you're looking at this thing, it's basically telling you, it's screaming at you how to do it. But westernized theology took it and fun, made it very fanciful and separate what God put together and so if Jesus was here and he hears the scripture he knows what it means because all of these things are together for him while you and your culture Western, the, the, the theology of the western world took it and break it up into pieces and put this across here and this across here so what you're trying to do is to play memory Remember, you know anybody know the, the card game memory where you actually put all the cards and then you pick up this card, you remember where these things are? He does the, does the game that you were taught to play with the Bible. You're playing memory. Where this is, boy. What? But instead of calling it memory, you're playing, um, you, 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 are, you are playing, you're playing theology. This is, this here, no? No, this is kind of together. No? <laughs> you're busy. And you think that you're straight how to walk, how do you think? Now, in this context, we see that man begins to create the garden. And then, after he creates the garden, it then shows you that God says it is not good for man to be alone. And so he creates some helpers. And the first line of helpers are the animals. Now, if you saw this session that we did on... What was the title? Um... We spoke about devils. Um, for any I, 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 I forgot the title. But basically, what we are actually talking about there is we saw that the animals were the first helpers. We also identified in that session that the difference between Yahweh Adam and helpers, Yahweh helpers, is that the man. The title Yahweh means self-existent and therefore that in the concept of a mindset translates into what you call self-determining. Self-determining. And because the garden is his will, the garden is his nature, he determines things according to the will, according to the nature that is put into him. So basically he does not have an external source of wisdom. The garden in him is his wisdom. His wisdom here is his knowledge of what, how things work and how things don't work. The helper, the Yahweh helper, is the being that is created to receive knowledge or to receive to receive knowledge or to receive thoughts. The helper receives thoughts. Yahweh man generates thoughts because he is self-determining based on what the spirit is in him how the castor denounce in the title and the, yes thank you very much there sir <laughs> i appreciate that so so basically if the helper is the receiver of information the helper does not generate his own thoughts the helper receives thoughts and begins to walk that out 
in the context of the garden in the context of the garden of Eden man is, is created to generate these thoughts while the helper is receiving thoughts and then God creates woman who is a different type of helper a help meet and the both of them are one flesh which means she is not the same helper as the animals now then a conversation ensues and the man finds himself outside of the garden why because the man switches his reference point he's no longer using the spirit in him as his reference point to make decisions to determine his thoughts he begins to listen to the helper and in the context of the ancient Israelites or the ancient Hebrews or let's say the ancient priests your source of wisdom or your source of wisdom is technically your father as well so when he listened to the serpent and the serpent is a helper he uses the serpent as a source of wisdom and the serpent becomes his father and right after that in the text it refers to them as the seed of the serpent right it refers to man as the seed of the serpent now right there in particular we have a problem because man who is made to be self-existent because he was given god's name this is confirmed in Isaiah 45. It says that he, he whom God creates, he gave his name. The prophet Isaiah even speaks about it. And so we know that he was functioning self-existently. The name, therefore, this is one of the, the most significant findings that we have at, at the International Institute of Pneumatology and dispersed through the Anointed Life Minds Mentorship International Community is that the name of God to the ancient priests, prophets, and the apostles, even Yeshua, was not just a name that you used to identify. It actually is a, a mindset, a cognitive law, a way of thinking. And the name also identifies the role. Whatever the name means, identifies the role that Yahweh is playing in the narrative most and this is this is true for most people in the scriptures whatever their names mean defines the role that they are playing in the narrative so if abraham means father of many nations when you read it you could interchange father of many nations with abraham and it give you context as to what the father of many nations was was actually thinking about and what he did see what i'm saying most people's names in the scriptures are like that and yahweh's name is no different if he's the self-existent and if yahweh is the self-existent and the eternal then you could interchange the name yahweh and say the self-existent and the eternal said this and that gives you context to what he says because if what if he if that is the if the name determines the role that he's playing in the text then anything that he says is actually carrying the nature of his name and since yahweh means self-existent and eternal then everything that he says is also self-existent and eternal what does that mean exactly it simply means that whatever yahweh says does not have a condition it is self-existent which means the reader should understand that whatever he says you have to take it and make it your own so that it governs your will so that you can make decisions driven by his thoughts as your will so you are now functioning self-determiningly or self-existently it also means that whatever he says is eternal that means that it does not have an expiry date it means that you can actually benefit from it without exhausting it if you're following that, type type God. <laughs> if you're following that, type God. Therefore, if that is how the name works, everything must be self-determining, and then it is it is existent. It is um it is eternal 
then naturally, whatever God says in the garden is actually inside of the man. When, and when he actually makes a decision to use an external reference point, it's the first time in the narrative where the man is not using God in him. He's using the serpent. He makes the serpent his father, and now he is functioning like a helper. A self-determining entity now begins to function like a helper, meaning that he's not creating his thoughts anymore from the will that God puts in him. He's depending on things to tell him what to do. And that right there is where you have been living for most of your life. Is it upon the woman? Absolutely not. The serpent is the help is a helper. The woman is a help meet. That's a different story. Now, this is where most of you have been living all of your life. And the moment he begins to function as like the helper, he abandons God in him. And since God in him is actually the wisdom of the garden that was put into him, and the garden is God's word in the form of a life of a, of a living realm that is put into him as his will. He is the realm. When the serpent said that God lied, is the same thing as saying that your, that your spirit is a lie. And so he abandons his spirit and now he's beginning to, to, to pursue a source of wisdom outside of himself. Taking on the mindset of the serpent. Because the serpent is a helper. Type helper. Helper here is the one who is receiving thoughts. So he watches the tree. And he begins to copy the tree because he is receiving thoughts now. He is no longer generating thoughts from the nature that God put in him. If you're following that, type helper. Now, having said that, that places man in a position where he is receiving thoughts, and that is the beginning of death. This is where death is born. It's not born outside of the man. It's born in him. Because if your source of wisdom, if God said that he breathed the breath of life in the garden, into the man, and the garden will came his nature, the garden, the garden therefore and the breath of life are one and the same. Therefore, if he's functioning from the garden within him, he's functioning in life. If he's pursuing a source of wisdom outside of himself, indirectly, no one pursues what you already have. So if he was told that this is a lie, what God in him says, or the garden in him is, is a lie, and he begins to pursue a sort of wisdom outside of himself, which is why the woman saw the tree, and saw it was good to make one wise. Then the moment he does that, what he is doing is pursuing life because if your source of wisdom is your life now he's pursuing life and if he's pursuing life by inversion he now identifies as death and death sicknesses diseases and infirmities began from there well, it's very necessary that you really understand the simplicity in that progression is that simple type simple Did this serpent literally talk to the woman? Was it a thought? Remember, their eyes opened and they saw that they were naked. What does that tell you? If you invert that, if that's the moment that the eyes were opened and then they realized that they were naked and they were ashamed, then before that, all of that took place in spirit, in thought. All of that is actually a scene communicating communication in thought, not a physical communication. Simple, type simple. Now I know for those of you here in this for the first time, this might be a lot for you to digest because you've been taught all of your life that God created it in seven days. There is no mystery behind that. This is no mystic, mystical knowledge, just really narrative slow. It literally says that chapter one was created before anything was in the earth. And, through chapter, and then chapter two is man and God together that's bringing this into the earth. There is no mystical thing here. There's no big secret. No mystical teachings. It's straight 
written in the Bible. So let's move on. Now, when this happens, fast forward a few generations, up comes Moses. Moses is told to take on the name Yahweh. Genesis, Exodus chapter 6, go read it. God tells him, go speak to the elders like this. To say, I am Yahweh, and then give the message. Which is not something that is very difficult for Moses to, to assimilate. Because in just in chapter 4 of Exodus, it shows you how Pharaoh's guards carries a message from Pharaoh. Not by saying, oh Israelite slaves. Pharaoh just said that he will no longer give you straw. They don't say that. It's, it, it seemed to be a cultural thing. It seemed to be something that even Egyptian priests and priestesses would do when they're representing some, 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 something. If the Egyptian priest was representing a god, they would, say, they would actually speak like the god. And in the same way, Pharaoh's gods arrives by the Israelites, representing Pharaoh. And what do they say? Thus says Pharaoh, I will give you no more straw. You will make bricks without straw. <laughs> See, this is something in particular that we think is blasphemy in our culture. But in the ancients, that was normal. So for a prophet to say, thus says Yahweh, and speak as Yahweh, it's very normal. Westernized Christianity took it. When I say Westernized, Greco-Roman Christianity took it and made that blasphemy. It is not. It's just how the scriptures work. Because... Yahweh is your original identity from the garden. Okay. So Moses is actually told, go, to, go, go back to the desert in response to Genesis chapter 3 and tell the serpent, let my people go. He takes them from there. They walk through the Red Sea. Then they go to Sinai and they begin to learn God's thoughts. Now listen up very carefully because this is where we come into tonight. For you to understand why you should be healed. So he takes them, he brings them there, and then God takes them up on the mountain and God gives them a plan. A plan of the garden. And Moses takes this plan and he builds this plan. He builds a physical model of the garden. Now in the first, in the garden of Eden, the garden was in man. Now when man fall, fell outside of the garden, he, was, he abandoned his own spirit and because of the corruption, using external things to tell him what to think, not living from the realm in him, just like you have the realm of the New Jerusalem in you right now, but you have been by, by a, you're, you've, grown by a, uh, you've, you've grown accustomed listening to things like Google and doctor reports and all these things telling you what to think. Just like the man, you clothe yourself with the source, just as the man used the tree as the source of wisdom, he clothed himself with leaves. And then God came and clothed him with animal skin, showing him that you use the mindset of the, of the serpent. And therefore, you are clothed with the serpent. Now you could say that that clothing there, because the serpent is the reference point, because the serpent was saying something that was not what God said, the title Satan is given to him. That's why the, the person in Revelation says, the, 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 that great serpent, Satan, that great serpent. Because Satan, which is, the, which is the correct pronunciation of it, is an entity that is saying something contrary to God. So technically, if this animal skin is on the man, then you could say that the man is technically clothed with, his, with the helper. And therefore, if that is the, this is Satan, he's clothed with Satan. And this basically was the actual understanding of how a devil would, would actually affect someone. You clothe yourself with him by taking on his mindset. And many of you, for all of your life, have been accustomed listening to Google and doctor reports and what the doctor says and what the media says. And what you're doing is that you're clothing yourself with that. And if it is not saying what God says, it's a false Elohim. It's a false reference point. That's called a Satan. That's called a devil. And that's how you're clothing yourself with devils. Taking on mindsets that are not from your spirit, which is Christ in you. Okay. So now, 
hear, 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 hear how this works. Moses takes them, he gets that, he builds the tabernacle, and then the sacrificial system that starts. Now, if you see the progression of the, sac the sacrificial system, it's the same thing that took place with the first garden, the same thing that took place with this garden. This is a physical model of the garden. Imagine God create man with garden in him. Man made a decision that caused him to not have garden in him anymore. He used something else to fill himself with. And God, just to keep man functioning in the, in the nature that God gave him, God built a physical model of the garden for him to live in. And that began God taking the spiritual realities of the first garden and making it a physical structure, a physical environment. If, if you're following that, type physical environment. If you're following that type physical environment. So now the God that was breathed into him, Moses is told to build it. And so since they can't reproduce it from their spirit, God takes it and makes it a physical environment. And they, then, then they have a covenant. And the covenant is designed to bring them back into the atmosphere of heaven, which is the atmosphere of the garden. This is why when Moses finishes the construction, and even King Solomon finishes the construction, what they do is that they speak to God and the presence of God comes in and fills the structure. For the presence of the Spirit is heaven, whilst the physicality of the structure is earth. And so in the Old Testament, the tabernacle and the temple was actually what heaven and earth was. So man come into, co come into covenant, they were told to circumcise the foreskin of the genitalia, which represented taking off the animal skin, which means stop thinking using external reference points. Number one. Number two, then you ceremonially wash in, in running water, which was actually representative of the living waters in the garden because this is a physical model of the garden. So they, they dip into the living waters and they arise as though they come out of a womb. And they come, out of the, they come out of the water with the name Yahweh. Which is why God says in the Old Testament, If my people who are called by my name. In the New Covenant, by the way, James says that you are called by his name, which is Yeshua. Just like them. Right? You take down the name and then you memorize the Torah. Because Moses put together the Torah as the naturally occurring thoughts of the man in the garden. Which means they memorize the Torah so that they could take on the name and think the thoughts of that identity or that spirit. To try to reproduce that after their own kind. Now, because the inner nature was still corrupt from the first man, they memorized it and God said, keep it there. So it becomes their will. Here's the word again. It becomes their will. So they walk, keeping the commandments, by a strong will. Keep yourself reminded, oh, re rehearse it, until it becomes your strength of will. And you'll keep the commandments. Now naturally, when they sinned, and we need to understand that you're reading a Bible, and you have been taught by Greco-Roman Christianity that the Bible is God's rules for the entire world. That is not true. If the Bible is God's will for the entire world, then when the Bible was given to Moses, the whole world should have been brought into the covenant automatically. But they didn't. Only people who were circumcised were included in the covenant. Only people who were circumcised were coming into the covenant. And there was a division of circumcised and uncircumcised. And for you to come into Israel, you needed to physically circumcise. There was there were criteria to come. There was criteria to come into the covenant. And in the, in the new covenant is the same, because even though the, the the distinction is no longer existent, nobody is held, nobody outside the covenant of Christ is held responsible to the covenant like those who are in the covenant of Christ. And it is on that note that Paul says that if he has to judge the world, sorry, he says, 
in First Corinthians 5 that he has no business judging the world only God can judge them but he can judge the house of faith because they're in covenant which means no believer have any right going and actually telling people who are not in the covenant that they're against God you'd be lying is that making sense? type no lies <laughs> no lies now, having said that, we're moving on to the sacrifice you now. So what will happen is, Israel comes to the covenant, and when they, when they, when they, they break the covenant, they, they would, they break any covenant by actually taking on thoughts from external reference points, right? So, let's make it very clear: righteousness is where you, where they would actually keep the commandments. Because they, they, they are called by the name Yahweh. So righteousness is where they keep the commandments or keep the words of the covenant. Um, sin, therefore, you, we can safely say that sin is taking on anything from external sources of wisdom and making it your own. And therefore, all types of behaviors that are considered sin as well, as a result of you having an external source of wisdom and all of the the offenses like violence and all of these things that comes about it's because you have an external source of wisdom that someone is threatening to take from you or something along that line and so you get defensive you feel desperation to try to keep it you see people in your society today doing that with money with possessions with spouse, with having a family, with having a car, with having a career, academic accomplishments, social status, and the list goes on. These are the external sources of wisdom and those things are telling them what to do and who they are. Threaten it, and they either fall into depression or they want to kill you. Envy, all of these things. This is what the, 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 the apostles refer to as the pride of life. Jesus the pride of life. It's the pride of the serpent life. Nice. Now having said this in particular, I say that about four times and I still didn't get it sacrificed, right? Therefore, when they commit sin, it's where they actually take in external reference points, external source of wisdom. They stop actually functioning from what the, what the, what the covenant said. To rid them of sin, this is where a sacrifice comes in. This is where our sacrifice comes in. Now, just as the first garden had helped us in this version of the garden, which is technically the second heaven and earth, we are living in the third. Yeah? The third. This is the, so they were in the second garden. The second garden was a physical model. And when they sin, then what they would do is that just as the animals in the first garden were the helpers of life, because they had thoughts of life, and therefore, the animal will be filled with their thoughts and execute that thought. In the same way, since they are now functioning from death, the nature's death, when they sin, that's a thought that they will take on and act upon that thought. That thought became the driving factor of their will. That thought became the driving factor of their will. with that present then that is actually when they act upon that notice that only when the man acted upon the thought in the garden is when he found himself outside the garden which means the thought without action is really nothing it's just an imagination the moment he acted upon it then you could see that he acted in faith and shift the whole garden into desert in the same way in the, in, the system, in the Old Testament system, you can have the thought. The moment you act upon the thought, that's now where you step into sin. And so what they will do is just as the helpers carry the thoughts at the beginning, then the animals will use as helpers in this physical model of the garden as well. So to rid themselves of the sin, what they would do, the priest would call them and tell them to lay their hands on the animals, symbolically passing the sin onto the animal, which is passing the thought 
And since, and since, listen up very carefully, since sin or what the man did in the garden led to the birth of death, which means, which means that death became an identity and began to express itself in many different ways. But the fullness of that action is actually death. Now, right here in particular, I need you to actually understand two things. And I want you to write this down. The first law of self-existence is that every spirit reproduces after its own kind. Write that down. The first law of self-existence is that every spirit reproduces after its own kind. The second law which is the law of sowing and reaping here, which also comes from this, which is also a law of the self-existent. Also, this the second law is that what you sow can only be reaped once. What you sow can only be reaped once. Write that down. So, when the person would sin and then they lay hands on the animal, then the, the priest would sacrifice the animal. When the, the priest sacrificed the animal and the animal died, then the animal reaped death on behalf of the man that sinned. The animal reaped death on your behalf. And since the sin could only be reaped, or death could only be reaped once, what happened to the man? Write in the comment section. If you understand, then you should have the answer there clearly. If you could only reap once and the animal reap death on behalf of the man and it could only reap once, where does that leave that where, where does that leave the man? He lived, which means Boom, it's ripped and he lives. He reap it on behalf of him. The animal reaped it for him. Therefore the man has life. And he walks out with an with full of life. Now let's take it to the Bible so you can see how this worked. We're going to Leviticus chapter 14. Shout out to Holy Sister Odelia Jackson. Blessings and much love. We're going to Leviticus 14. Let me just show you how this works. Oops. And then I'll show you two examples in the Bible of how this works. The death. Alright, no problem, no problem with this Sister Grace. Exodus 14, reading from verse 1. If you're there, get a Bible. Put it up on your screen, your computer screen, and type Leviticus in. Type Leviticus in the comment section if you're following. Leviticus. We're gonna read this and unpack it here. Type Leviticus in the comment section if you're following. Water Yahweh speak unto Moses, saying, This shall be the law of the leper in the day of his cleansing. He shall be brought unto the priest, and the priest shall go forth out of the camp. And the priest shall look, and behold, if the, if the, if the plague of leprosy be healed in the leper, then shall the priest command to take from him, to take for him, that is to be cleansed, 
Two birds alive and clean, and cedarwood and scarlet and hyssop. And the priest shall command the one of the birds. Now pay attention to what's going on here, right? So the priest shall command to take for him that is to be cleansed two birds alive and clean. Two birds alive and clean. And cedarwood and scarlet and hyssop. Okay. Then there's a colon. So let's let's read on to what it says. And the priest and the priest shall command that one of the birds be killed in an earthen vessel over running water. In an earthen vessel, one of the birds be killed in an earthen vessel. Um, over was uh, sorry. One of the birds be ki was killed over the o o over the running water. Sorry, I skip obviously. So as for the living, this way I skipped that way. I skipped far away. And the priest shall command that one of the birds, which is verse five, one of the birds be killed in an earthen vessel over running water. Colon. Verse 6 As for the living bird, he shall take it, and the cedar wood, and the scarlet and the hyssop, and shall dip them and the living bird in the blood of the bird that was killed over the running water. So follow this. They kill the first bird. Verse 5 Kill an earthen vessel over running water. As for the living bird, so one bird you just killed. The next bird is the living bird. The living bird, you shall take it and you see the wood and the scarlet and the hyssop and shall dip them and the living bird in the blood of the bird that was killed over the running water. So you kill one and then you're taking the next bird and dipping that bird in the blood of the one that you just killed. Now this might sound confusing, right? But hold on, it will make a lot of sense just now, just in a moment. And he shall sprinkle upon him that is to be cleansed from the leprosy seven times. So now he's sprinkling the blood of the bird that was killed on the man seven times and shall pronounce him clean and shall let the living bird loose into the open field. And he that is cleansed shall wash his clothes, shave off all his hair, where are we? Verse 8 And he has to be cleansed, shall wash his clothes and shave off all his hair, and wash himself in water, that he may be clean. And after that, he shall come into the camp and shall tarry abroad out of his tent seven days. But it shall be on, okay. but it shall be on the seventh day that he shall shave off all his hair, off his head. And his beard and his eyebrows, even all his hair, he shall shave off, and shall wash his clothes, and he shall wash his flesh in water, and shall be clean. So let's pause there for a moment. Now you can, we can read the rest of the chapter, and we're not going to get into all of that here. We're using this here to show you how a sacrifice works. Notice that they get two living birds, clean and alive. Then. This is simple spiritual dynamics. Remember, we said in the garden, whatever you use as your reference point, as your source of wisdom, you might include themselves with it. And then God put animal skin because he used the animals, he took on the animal as a reference point and used the animal's mindset. So God put him with animal skin, showing him that he's now in the identity of the animal. He's clued himself with this animal. But I see it and you can see that he also clued himself with devil, with devils. Well, in the context of what the devil is. Notice that the first thing that they do is that they kill the animal. Which means the animal is suffering death on behalf of the man's sin. Because sin, the fullness of sin is death. Which means if the moment you step into the identity, you have sowed into the identity and the identity has to be ripped fully. Death is the fullness of of that identity. Now, sin is not something that you just did. Most of us were taught this in, in, in our Western Christian culture, in our Greco-Roman culture. 
most of us were taught that when you sin it's like points and then you need your points erased or you need your points um you, you need you need you need you need recom well recompense will be given for your points this is not how this worked in the bible please let it be known that this is not how it's working in the bible sin was not something external of you sin was you stepping into the characteristic of the identity that the man gave birth to in the garden which is why jesus could become sin so that you could become the righteousness of god it's an identity and then you have a list of actions which would be like characteristics of that identity so you take on the mindset of death and then you begin to take on characteristics of death is this making sense type sense now, this is why if christ is in you G, um, john in his letter says that if you are in christ you cannot sin because sin is actually coming into a different identity and if you have the spirit of christ in you then they in the old testament could sin because they had a false elohim and they they gave birth to the identity of death if you have christ in you then you cannot sin because they, that identity does not exist in you in any in, in, in the body of men anymore what you are doing is living in a lack of wisdom which is why christ has made wisdom unto you if you're not walking and did something that is not christ-like then you in a lack of wisdom it is not sin it is unfortunate that the new testament authors the only new testament translators translate what paul says in hamatia as sin but it means missing the mark meaning not living according to your own spirit not reproducing after your own kind is that is that is that is that making sense type sense all right we're moving on so now this man does what he does and he begins to repeat in sickness in sickness on his body let's say he is repeated in sickness on his body and the animal is used to die on his behalf now when the animal for, the, for him to be included in the animal dying on his behalf he has to be clothed with the animal so what you do is that you kill one animal and you take the next one and dip it which means you remember the life of the blood sorry the, the blood um the life of the animal is the blood which means you can say that the spirit of the animal is in the blood so if you kill one animal then one animal you can say one spirit has reaped death on his behalf then they take the other animal and dip it in the blood clothing the animal with the blood of the first remember you clothe it so now it's now clothed with the spirit of the first see that they've just become one spirit and you take that and you sprinkle it seven times on the man so now you clothe the man with the spirit of the of, of, of the animal the animal that died therefore you just united him with that sacrifice he's clothed with that and therefore the man inherits the death as though it is his personal death he died already for that the other bird in particular clothed with the same spirit is then let go being me showing showing that you died and now you're free by sprinkling the blood on the man and clothing the bird with the blood both entities have become one spirit with that blood and therefore they have reaped on their behalf sorry the man the animal reaped on his behalf death and the next bird being clothed the actions of the next bird is attributed since you clothe the animal with the blood of the first 
the animal, the, 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 the action of that animal in flying away is also attributed to the first spirit. So let's, re let's, let's just re recap what we just said there. You could only reap death once, or you only reap what you sow once. Yeah? We only reap it once. <laughs> okay. Every spirit reproduces after its own kind, and you can only reap what you sow once. In this case, this man comes needs needs cleansing. They take two birds. That's two spirits. They take the first bird and they kill the first bird over running water. Right? Running water means water of life. Yeah? The first bird is killed, put in an earthen vessel. Remember, the man outside of the garden was called Adam, meaning dust. So the earthen vessel is representative of the, fo of, the uh, of, of, of the man living by the dust. So you pour the, 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 they put the blood into that. Then they take the other bird and they dip it in the blood of the first, just as the man clothed himself with his, with his reference point and became one with it and took on the identity of that. So dipping the next bird in the blood of the first is clothing with it so that the, 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 the living bird takes on the identity of the bird that um, of the bird that that blood is attached to so now that is one spirit then they sprinkled blood on the man seven times to bring him into union with that spirit so technically the man by coming into union by being clothed with the blood takes on the, the identity of the, bed, of the blood of the bird that died and therefore, he is living as though he died because the bird reaped it on his behalf and he is now brought into union with the first. See what I'm saying? So now, when he lets go the bird, not only by the union is he has inherited death, but the bird gone free means that he is now free. And now he's, he's inherited freedom. He can now walk out with life and free from the guilt and from everything that is connected to what he sowed. If that makes sense, type freedom. Type freedom. See how simple that is? No rocket science. Right? It's simply one thing. One, one, the sacrifice is the thing that is actually reaping it for you. You clothe the person with the, with the spirit that has been sacrificed. And that person inherits the sacrifice as though they inherit. They, they, that's part of their history. They inherit it as though that is their history. And then the next bird flow off. They inherit that as, their, as, if their, as, as, as though that is their history as well. So now the, the man inherited the death of the bird and the freedom of the and the freedom of, of the other as though that is personal history because you clothe both with the spirit of the sacrifice. Simple? Type simple. If that is simple, type simple. Right? This is this is really simple, straightforward spiritual dynamics. It is spiritual dynamics is not is not difficult. It simply works by the laws of the garden. Every spirit reproduces after its own kind. You reap what you sow once. All right, good. So most of you, if you just heard that there, you should be able to, to explain that again, right? It's real simple. Now, here's what I'll do. I'll show you two examples of how a sacrifice, once it is done, liberates the person that it is sacrificed for immediately. Watch. 
We're going to 2 Samuel chapter 24. Reading from verse 1. <clears throat> 2 Samuel chapter 24. Now, for those of you who actually read going to 2 Samuel chapter 24 for the first time, I just this is just to give you context that this is actually something that happens with David after he does something that God tells him not to do. God tells him, do not number Israel. Don't number Israel for war or anything like that. And and David went ahead and did it. And some of you may ask, why was that a problem? That was a problem because Israel was actually a God nation, the God nation. And if Israel is the God nation, then Israel took on the name of the man in the garden, and the man was responsible for, for creating heaven and earth. Which means if you come into the God nation, then heaven and earth is actually functioning, functioning in union with you. So when Israel, Israel kings came in to covenant, they came into a covenant and made an oath to walk in Yahweh and heaven and earth will fight with Israel in battles. So while they're going to war with, with Israel, hornets coming for you, wind blowing at you, the sun scorching you because heaven and earth were supposed to fight with the garden people. Just like Christ ascended to fill all things so that when Christ in you, when you begin to function from Christ in you, Christ in all things works in union with you. How many hours saying that for the first time? That's why there was a certain individual, doesn't come to mind right now, went to war. And God caused, well actually he was going to war, and God caused wind to blow through the trees. And the tree and the sound that went to the army was like another army was coming and they scampered, left, gone, foosh. That's heaven and it working in union with Israel. That is why Israel wasn't supposed to multiply the chariots, nor multiply the soldiers, nor multiply the silver and gold, because heaven and earth contains all the heaven and earth contains all the gold and the silver. So you, once you give Christ in you the priority and start to function from Christ in you as a priest of Christ Yeshua, all of heaven and earth works with you. If you hear that for the first time, type FT. Now, so, 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 so David clearly won some wars, started to trust in army and not trusting in Yahweh in heaven and earth anymore. So he's going contrary to the covenant. Starboy, contrary to the covenant. <laughs> Numbers Israel and then begins to reap it. Let's read. Now you're watching this to see here how a sacrifice liberates somebody, the person that it is sacrificed for. Reading from verse 1. And again, the anger of Yahweh was kindled against Israel. And he moved David against them to say, Go, number Israel and Judah. For the king said to Joab, the captain of the host, which was with him, Go now, go, go now through all the tribes of Israel, from Dan even to Beersheba, and number ye the people, that I may know the number of the people. And Job said unto the king, Now, now Yahweh thy Elohim add unto the people, add unto the people how many soever there be, and hundredfold, and that the eyes of my lord the king may see it. But why doth my lord the king delight in this thing? Notwithstanding, the king's word prevailed against Job, and against the captains of the hosts. And Job and the captains of the hosts went out from the presence of the king to number the, 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 uh, the people of Israel. And they passed over Jordan and pitched in Aroah, on the right side of the city that lies in the midst of the river of Gad, and toward Jazer. Then they came to Gilead, and to the land of Tatim Hodshi, and they came to Danjan, and about to Zidon, and came to the stronghold of Tyre, and to all the cities of the Hivites and of the Canaanites, and they went to the south of Judah, even to Beersheba. So when they had gone through all the land, they came to Jerusalem at the end of nine months and twenty days. And Joab gave up the sum of the number of the people unto the king. And there were in Israel eight hundred thousand valiant men that drew the sword. So they almost had a million. 
And the men of Judah were 500,000 men. So that helped him cross a million. And David's heart smote him after that he had numbered the people. And David said unto Yahweh, I have sinned greatly in that, in that I have done. And now I beseech thee, O Yahweh, take away the iniquity of thy servant, for I have done very foolishly. When David was up in the morning, the word of Yahweh came unto the prophet Gad, David's seer, saying, Go and say unto David, Thus saith Yahweh, I offer thee three things. Choose thee one of them, that I may do it unto thee. Now, note, I want you to take note of something here, right? Because they are in covenant, and the covenant is a covenant that brings you into the garden, which is bringing you into heaven, which is what your covenant doing you right now. They very they do not see anything outside of God, because they're in covenant with God, and God is the spirit of heaven and earth. Then, if something is happening, they would say God. If something is happening, they would say God did it. But really and truly, is the law of sowing and reaping. They sow that into the spirit of heaven and earth, and they reap it, because that law does not is not suspended for any any for, for any man. So they would say God did it because they were in covenant. They are very God aware. So God came to David and told him and said to him, "Wait." Right. So so God came to David and told him and said unto him, "Shall seven years of famine come unto thee, come unto thee in thy land? Or will thou, will thou flee three months before thine enemies while they while they pursue thee? Or that there be three days pestilence in thy land?" Now advise, and see what answer I shall return to him that sent me. And David said unto God, I am in a great strait. You are done right in a great strait. <laughs> let us fall now into the hand of Yahweh, for his mercies are great, and let me not fall into the hand of man. Now I want you to take note of how David put some logic to that, right? The other two meant that they would actually have to depend on men. And he chose not to depend on the hand of man, but to fall into the hands of Yahweh. A wise man. Something that our generation of believers need to take into consideration. Instead of committing yourself to people and sciences and all of these things to help, for help. Okay. So Yahweh sent a pestilence upon Israel. Now, here's what's going on here now. Eh? From the morning even to the time appointed, and they died of the people from Dan even to Beersheba, 70,000 men. There's almost 100,000 men gone. And when the angel stretched out his hand upon Jerusalem to destroy it, Yahweh repented him, repented him of the evil and said to the angel to destroy that people, it is enough. Stay now thine hand. So now the thought of God takes on the form of this being that is being seen as an angel of Yahweh. And it, sorry, the thought of God has been executed by the angel. And in, in the Old Testament, angels were commonly used to refer to priests because they were driven by what God said. Right? They were like the messengers. No, that is not to say that they didn't have actual apparitions, but very commonly priests and prophets were called angels because they were actually acting upon what God said. And the angel of Yahweh was by the threshing place of Arauna the, of, of, of Arauna the Jebusite, and David spake unto Yahweh. When he saw the angel, that smote the people and said, Lo, I have sinned and I have done wickedly. But these sheep, what have they done? Let thine hand, I pray thee, be against me and against my father's house. Now what David doesn't understand is that since David was actually appointed to be king, he was king over the garden nation. And the king is the one that is actually given, is the one made authority over the nation. Which means, listen up very carefully, what you make, an, what you make your authority, you fill yourself with. So all of Israel making the king the authority is being filled with the, being filled with the spirit of David. Let me say that again. Whatever you make your source of wisdom, 
you make your authority, you make your Elohim, or you make your God. Whatever you, <clears throat> whatever you make your authority, you are filling yourself with or clothing yourself with it. Yeah, filling your mind, clothing yourself with it, and you're brought into union with the spirit that you're using as a reference point, just like the sacrifice. Which means, if David does something wrong, wherever David's spirit, is, whatever David's spirit is filling, all of David is going to be affected. This was the same thing that you saw when the Philistines stole the Ark of the Covenant. All Philistines worshipped the god Dagon. And when they placed, this is five cities of Philistines that worship Dagon. Whatever you worship, whatever your authority is, you are filling yourself with, you're including yourself with it, bring, bringing yourself into union with the source of wisdom or with that Elohim. When they brought the ark into the, cover, into the temple of Dagon and Dagon fell the first night and the second night they saw Dagon broken by the legs and fallen on his face, everybody in all five cities developed tumors in their bodies. Why? Because if they're worshipping Dagon and Dagon falls, then everybody that is filled with the spirit of that, even though it's a statue, because they're treating it as though it's real, they're filling themselves with that, then everybody that fills with that, fill themselves with that spirit will be affected. Is this making sense? Because you are filled and clothe yourself with what you use as your source of wisdom and you're going to manifest the fruits of of your elohim of your god of your source of wisdom it'll manifest on your body as though you are that person see these are spiritual dynamics that are in your bible it is not taught in our culture but it is in the bible by the law of the garden Every spirit reproduces after its own kind. Fill yourself and clothe yourself with that spirit, then you'll reproduce after that spirit's kind. Sense? Type sense. Now, since David is authority and king over the garden people, and they're looking at David, which is why God didn't really want to give them a king because Yahweh was supposed to be the authority therefore they should all be filled and clothed with Yahweh but they wanted a king just like another nation so they made the king there and since they have to follow the instruction of that king that's the authority then they fill and include themselves with, his, with, with, the, with, the, with the spirit of that person what he does affects the nation because all of them in the same spirit okay we're moving on. Listen to this, right? I have sinned and done wickedly, but these sheep, what they have they done? Let thine hand, I pray thee, be against me and against my father's house. This is the same thing happened with the man in the garden. The man in the garden changes reference point to the serpent, uses the serpent mindset, clothe himself in animals, can and starts to reproduce after his own kind. This is how Jesus actually cleansed the spirit of Adam from everybody through the same law. We come into that, and God came that, and God came that day to David, and said unto him, "Go up, rear an altar unto Yahweh, in the threshing floor of Arauna the Jebusite." And David, according to the saying of God, went up as Yahweh commanded. And Arauna looked and saw the king and his servants coming on toward him and Arauna went on and bowed himself before the king on his face upon the ground and Arauna said wherefore is my lord the king come to his servant and David said to buy the trash and floor of thee to build an altar of Yahweh that the plague may be, may be stayed from the people and Arauna said unto David let my lord the king take and offer what seemeth good unto him Behold, here be oxen for burnt sacrifice and threshing instruments and other instruments of the oxen for wood. 
All these things did around her as a did around her as a king give unto the king. And around her said unto the king, Yahweh thy Elohim accept thee. And the king said unto Arauna, Nay, but I will surely buy it of thee at a price. Neither will I burnt offering, neither will I offer burnt offerings unto Yahweh my Elohim of that which does not cost me nothing. Notice David understands something here. That you should always sacrifice that it that which is your that thing which is precious. A sacrifice is where you sacrifice any priority that is not what Yahweh said. In other words, whatever is your source of wisdom, you should sacrifice it. Because that is the thing that you're using as your source of wisdom, as you, that is the thing that, that you're using as your life's priority for your strength, for your confidence. You sacrifice it. Because that is what that which is precious to you. You made that precious to you. Sacrifice it and come back to Christ in you. And this is something that all of us here need to take awareness of because repentance is really the sacrifice of your priorities that are not what Yahweh said. These are external priorities that you're living by. Some of them is money, provision, validation from other people, social status, academic status, having a career, being seen as a good husband, you're beating your chest with that, or a good wife. Instead of actually, are you a Yahweh husband or a Yahweh or a Christ husband or a Christ wife? No, you're trying, you're trying to get validation from all of these different things or you use them as a source of wisdom. So repentance is that. And David understands that repentance is actually where you let go the thing that really costs you. Which is that which is precious to you, right? Then it says, but I will surely buy it of thee as a price. Neither will I burnt offering unto thee away my Elohim of that which doth cost me nothing. So David brought the treasure and flew on the oxen for fifty shekels of silver. David built an altar unto Yahweh and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. So Yahweh was entreated for the land and the plague was stayed from Israel. Notice, you could only reap the death. You could only reap it once. It was ripped on the altar and everybody in the land was set free. If you're seeing that, type freedom. Now because of the length of time that we're here, I will not go into the next excerpt that I was going to read with you all, which was when David slept with Bathsheba. She had a child for him. She was impregnated. And a good example of that again, of you could only reap it once, is that when she when she fell sick, when she, there was problems with the birth of the child, I think she was she was she was unwell, or there was a problem with the birth of the child. And David mourned. And when he mourned, asking God, the child to be saved, the child did not live. The child died. As soon as the child died, David got up, brushed off all of his ashes, and began to eat. And they watched him like, what is wrong? How all of a sudden you, you were mourning all the time, the child is now dead and now you're there? Because David understood he could only reap death once. And since he made that decision, and, the child reaped, de and he reaped death through the child, for his actions, there was no more to be reaped, and he was free. If you're following that, type freedom. Everybody. Type freedom. Notice in both cases that I'm showing you here, that, the that, the, that, that death could only be reaped once. The sicknesses and infirmities and death only reaped once once okay all right we're following now let's go across to isaiah chapter 53 so you could see what you're looking at <laughs> 
Isaiah 53. How many of us have read it so many times? And now you're going to see something here that you didn't see before. If you're there, turn in your Bible to Isaiah 53. If you're there, type Isaiah. Now this is the simple law of sacrifice here. Eh? The law of sacrifice is based on every spirit reproducing after its own kind and that actually expressing itself in you can only reap what your soul wants. So if you sow into that identity, you reap you can only reap the fruit of that identity once. Notice that, that was the sacrifice by the man, by the animal clothed with the spirit of the first, brought it into union, and then sprinkled on the man, brought the man into the union with that blood. The man inherited that as the death and the freedom as his personal history, because he's now in union with that spirit. Therefore, what happened there is now his history, and he is free, having reaped, death being reaped. On his behalf it could only be reaped once and freedom after that all right everybody else freedom i only see in three sub three persons in freedom sorry isaiah let me see in same freedom isaiah right if you're following now let's read isaiah and see where this works who had believed our report unto whom is the arm of yahweh revealed for he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and there, we sh and there we shall see him. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief. Colon, mean expansion again, and and we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Now the difference with Jesus coming up here, because he's speaking about Yeshua, right? The difference with Yeshua is that Yeshua took on the identity of the man outside of the garden by faith. Took on the spirit, the corrupt spirit. And what when he took on the corrupt spirit, all of Yeshua's persecution, where you were watching it from the perspective that they whipped him and then they crucified him, from the garden perspective, Yeshua took on the identity of death and reaped the fruit and the expression of death by the law of sowing and reaping. I want you to slow down and think about what I just told you there. You have been taught that they whipped him because you see it from the outside perspective that they, that they whipped him and then they crucified him. And even though that is true on the what you're looking at, you're looking at it from outside the garden. And outside of the garden is, they do him that. They did him that. He did that to me. Inside of the garden, every spirit reproduces after his own kind. So when Yeshua took on the identity of the fallen man outside of the garden, the flogging, the stripes, and the crucifixion, everything he experienced there was him reproducing after the after the kind of death. Everybody following up? Type follow. So from in the garden, he takes on the identity and this is the fruit of the identity that he took on. Allowing it to exhaust itself in him. See what we're saying there, right? Type follow. So, so from outside of the garden, you see that it did him something. From inside of the garden, he's reaping the expression of that spirit that he's taken on as, a, and as identity to put it to death. Okay? So it allow it to reap in its fullness, exhaust itself in him. Reading on. Verse 4. Surely he had borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. See, he take on the identity and now he's carrying it. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. 
but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Colon. Wounded and bruised. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. If you go back to Deuteronomy, you'll notice that stripes, the stripes that he received was according to the stripes of the law. And the stripes literally represented the in 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 the, in the no i'm not going to go into deuteronomy here because i already over two hours here right so just going to keep it you all could go check it for yourself you can actually see in the book of deuteronomy just run a search on stripes and look at and look at it and you'll see that stripes there was actually given to men who were actually found guilty all right and yeshua they would get to receive 40 stripes and yeshua receive the stripes and those stripes in particular even when Yeshua was alive and he spoke about sickness it was referred to as stripes which means this the sickness the, the stripes there not how many stripes we're talking about the stripes it's actually him receiving or expressing allowing to express himself in him and the stripes in particular covered your sickness sickness disease infirmity grief sorrows mental health issues all of these things were actually represented by those stripes so he carried it for you now remember the sacrifice is that somebody has to, the first animal because jesus in basically took on the role of the animal here because he is the lamb that was slain so technically he is the animal he is now the helper carrying the thoughts or carrying the spirit that the man sold in the garden that caused sicknesses and infirmities so he's he's actually taking it on and allowing it to fully express itself in him so he receives the stripes now we saw that the first animal was received fully receiving death the first animal basically um, died on behalf of the man who actually is being sacrificed for. And that guy inherited the death as though it is personal history, as well as the freedom of the bird. But before they, they did that, they sprinkled the blood on him to clothe him with the spirit so that he benefited from what took place with that spirit as though it was him we see here it says in verse 5 the chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes we are healed something missing he he carried it but was mankind actually clothed with it Go back to Isaiah 52. I'm going to show you something. <laughs> Scroll down to the last verse in Isaiah, to the last one, two, three, three verses of Isaiah 52. Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. My servant meaning Yeshua. Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and very high as many who are stunning at thee his visage was so mad which means the weapons he was so mad he was so mad you could actually hardly identify him he was so mad more than any man and his form more than the sons of men colon expansion so shall he sprinkle many nations <gasps> which means while he was getting whipped his blood sprinkled in the atmosphere and it, it landed upon the sons of Adam so he taken on the identity and everybody from the, the Adamic spirit around got sprinkled 
which means he clothed the whole of humanity because once he sprinkled just one from the from the race because he's doing it on he is taking on the spirit of the fallen man and he sprinkled just one more then everybody who have that spirit receive the sprinkle too they inherit it how many ever seen that for the first time that writes in the bible all i do is reading the bible to you, you know <laughs> i know even trying to interpret the scriptures here like i just showing you what in the bible <laughs> How many of us seen that for the first time? How many of us seen that for the first time? Type it. Type first time. I seen one FT, one me. First time. This has always been here, right? But you've just you've just learnt it from Westernized theology that does not understand how to read the Bible. So that's basically almost everybody here saying first time, right? That has always been there. Is Zane interpreting the Bible or is Zane just reading the Bible? Just write that down, please. Which one am I doing? Interpreting or reading? This is the thing about the Bible, you know? it, it interprets itself. <laughs> is it reading or interpreting the Bible? All I do is reading. <laughs> All I do is reading. So he sprinkled many nations. The kings shall shut their mouths at him. For that which had not been told them shall they see, and that which they had not heard shall they consider. Now let's go back to Isaiah 53. Who had believed our report? <laughs> now that comes into context. Because many of us quote that, and if you've now seen that for the first time, you're saying, Who had believed our report? You don't know what the heck, what report you're talking about. What report is he talking about? <laughs> He's speaking about a report. What report is he speaking about? The report that man, humanity, had been sprinkled with the blood of the whippings, clothed with it. Therefore, just as the man inherited the death of the bird and the freedom of the bird as his personal history, you, holy siblings, have inherited that whipping as your personal history. It was reaped already, and it could only be reaped once. For unto whom is the arm of Yahweh revealed? To the one who believed the report. You were clothed with the weapons. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He had no form nor comeliness and when, when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. And acquainted with grief and we hid it and we hid him not. Sorry, he is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief and we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he had borne our griefs. Borne the griefs because he was literally a sacrifice and the blood was sacred. Was you were clothed with the blood. Everybody who had the Adam and Spirit before was clothed with the blood. So therefore, he bore it just like the bird bore it. And I just use the bird because we could also, also go and look at the other sacrifices. I can always go and look at the, 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 the other sacrifices and, and show you how it's the same dynamics. But we don't want to do that all here tonight, right? We are on two hours and 11 minutes here already. Therefore, for, he was wounded for our transgression, he was bruised for iniquities, the chastisement of all peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Why? Because you were clothed with it. And if you were clothed with it, you inherited it as your personal history. And if you inherited it as your personal history, you are free. 
Therefore, you sitting down and accepting any sickness on your body is showing a lack of integrity to the sacrifice. By the integrity of the sacrifice, you need to get that sickness off of your body right now. Smite the blame darkness. But he didn't stop there alone. He didn't stop there alone. Because they took him after that and carried him on a cross. Call a son of Adam to help him with the cross. Which means all it takes is one member because he's, he's carrying the spirit. All it takes is one member of the other members <laughs> to be united with it and the whole species is united with it. When they call the man, Simon, to carry the cross, that is the whole species carry the cross. You didn't, you, didn't, you didn't realize that. <laughs> yeah? And the cross represented the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So, humanity carried the cross with him. He carried the cross on behalf of humanity. Oh, Lord. So now, because he called Simon, and Simon carried the cross a little bit, now the species unite with that sacrifice, and now what he did, they inherit it. You inherit it. You carry the cross by the law of sacrifice. <laughs> Holy Sister Odida saying, my, my, my. Because it goes deeper than what anybody had been taught. In addition to that, he carries it up the hill. They nail him, they nail him to the cross. And then they put two men from the species right beside him. So now the species was crucified with him. <laughs> right? Uh huh. Crucified with him. That's why Paul says we were crucified with him. You right? Literally crucified with him. He that unites himself with the Lord is one spirit. Exactly. Right? This is why it says here in verse 5, <clears throat> and with his stripes we are healed. It didn't say because of his stripes. It says with his stripes. Because when that blood was sprinkled, you inherited it as your personal history, just as that man inherited the death of the bird as his personal history. And the freedom of the bird, and the freedom of the next as his personal history as well. So with the sacrifice is free. Which is with his stripes you are healed. That means you, in her, you, you could say because of Yeshua that you were whipped already for any sickness on your body. Smite the blame darkness. Commanded to leave. I want this to start to circle in your mind and start to follow the laws of war and smite that with vengeance. Because it has no right there. Smite it with vengeance. No prisoners. Okay. <laughs> so after that, he, listen, listen up. He's on the cross. He died. They send the soldier. Watch how, watch how humanity get included here again. They send the soldier to pierce him and blood and water gushed out and hit the soul there. Poof! Sprinkle on a member of the, of, of, of the species which means the entire species just have been clothed with the sacrifice just like the man was clothed with the, with the bird that died and inherited the death right there Push, blood and water. Push, clothed with the crucifixion. All of humanity clothed with the crucifixion. 
So you could say that you died already. Because you only have to reap it once. And it was reaped through him. This is why the writer of Hebrews said it is, it is accounted unto all men to die once. And then if you continue reading, it says, but Christ. But Christ. So, right after that, three days later, they put him into the tomb, which means he died. Yeah? But be, listen, listen, listen. Remember the birds? Remember the birds? <laughs> the first bird died. Yeah? They take the second bird, clothe the, clothe the bird with the blood, uniting the spirit with, as one. Then they sprinkle it on the man. Rawr. Uniting him with that. So now this animal reap, since he's clothed with that, he is counted as have died already and free. Yeshua was on the cross. They stick him because he they thought he was just, just to make sure that he was dead. They stuck him because he died, just like the animal. Sprinkle humanity. Put him in a tomb and then God raised him. Like this, remember? So Jesus played the role of the first bird and the second bird. Death and then Yeshua played the role of the first bird and the second bird. Death and then resurrect. And since the blood on a member of the species already, then everybody just inherited that resurrection. Everybody has been liberated by the law of sacrifice liberated from the first because he put it to death and then resurrected with a full glorified spirit which is the same spirit is in you now by the law of sacrifice this is me educating your will And just as you will continue walking, no matter what you feel, your will is above your feelings. Now the resurrection must be above your feelings. The resurrection, the whipping post, and the death should be above your feelings. Because now, not only did he resurrect, but he ascended and seated on his throne. And because of the law of sacrifice, you seated there as well. As he is, so are you in this world. So here's my question to you. Is your will educated now? Yes or no? Write it in the comment section. Or do we need to go around this mountain again? <laughs> do we need to go around this mountain again? Yes or no? Is your will now educated? No mountain again. That is what we're saying. We don't want to say any willingness for 40 years. Don't harden your hearts. <laughs> Do not harden your hearts. This is so amazing, so amazing. Zane, can I get the links to these two studies? You sure, holy brother. Do not harden your hearts as those who were in the wilderness. Don't go wrong the mountain again. Your will is educated. Start walking strong. Resurrection, walk the resurrection. The resurrection of Christ actually will flow through the will. It is it is Christ in you. It is God in you, that is in you to will and to work His good pleasure. Which means if you make the resurrection, now that you understand this, and your will is educated, 
then your will can now be strong and courageous. And you can command your body based on that will. Let the will of what God has done be always higher than everything else in your life. Even poverty. Watch this. Watch me. I just reading the Bible for you. Second Corinthians chapter eight. No believer should be sick. Commanded to leave. Go to war. Smite the devil. Smite the sickness. Smite the darkness. Smite the serpent and the scorpion. That is just a serpent and a scorpion as an insect. Okay, to fear. Watch this. Second, this is for those who actually they think what God did that for me, for um, God did that for sickness and, and, and life. What, 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 what are our finances in? I struggle with finances. No way, boy. You're struggling with sight. <laughs> Watch this. Second Corinthians eight nine says. For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. Overturn the table. <laughs> because this basically saying, Second Corinthians eight nine, that Jesus carried poverty. Just that he carries sickness. So by the law of sacrifice, he carried poverty too. And right now he, he's, he ascended with his body. He's 2,000 years old in body. In a, city, in, a, in a city made of gold. And you still talking about boy life hard. Because you're allowing... Let me show you one more scripture here, right? <laughs> this is a serious thing here. I'm laughing, but it's a serious thing. Do you know that if you go to the blessings of the, of the, of the law of Moses, we can safely say that if you're walking in Yahweh, in the thoughts of Yahweh, then you will express blessings, right? And therefore, the curses mentioned in the law is an expression of the man outside of the garden. Yes? I want you to go to Deuteronomy 28. And we're reading. Just to turn to Deuteronomy 28. Watch this. Deuteronomy 28, you're scrolling down to the curses because I want to show you something that is written concerning, concerning what we're talking about here. And many believers don't realize that that is what's going on with them. Because you're allowing external sources of wisdom to tell you what is true. And you come from a covenant that comes with the law of sacrifice. And Jesus took on the role of the of the helper to carry everything that the man did for you and resurrected you which means with his tribes you will heal and with his resurrection you are a new creature right now I'm trying to find the verse I think it's 30 something in Ah, verse 34. 
Now remember the, the curses here is basically the results of the man who is living from the man outside of the garden, which is using external things as a source of wisdom. You're not living from the promises of God, which are the naturally occurring thoughts of Yahweh, of Christ in you. He's using external things. Verse 34 says, Thou shalt be mad for the sight of thine eyes which thou shalt see. Let me read that in the Amplified Version for you. That is King James. Let me give you the Amplified Interpretation right here. It says, You shall be driven mad by the sight of the things you see. That is why you do not walk according to sight and senses. Because you, it will drive you mad. You will be driven mad by the, by the sight of the eyes that you see. By the sight of the... Th um, sorry. Because of the sight which your eyes see. You shall be driven mad by the sight of the things you see. Sight is actually one of the five senses. If you use that above the will, you'll be driven mad. Because some of you see no finances. And you're going crazy. It, it is written that you will go crazy. <laughs> because you do not walk according to sight. And senses here above what God says. Now, let me make it very clear here. Emotions are not evil. You have emotions that come from what God says. And then there's emotions that come from external reference points. Your emotions that come with what God says are emotions of power. If you have emotions based on your five senses outside of what God says, those emotions will be fear and weakness unto you. So you have to make a decision. So are we walking by faith or by sight here? And for those of you who are actually experiencing sickness in the body, now is the time to actually understand that this is your, your will has been educated by the law of sacrifice. This has already been reaped for you. You have inherited, you have inherited the reaping as your personal history, but as your spiritual history. Get up and command. Say after me, in the name of Christ Yeshua, serpents and scorpions have been given authority over you. The works of the enemy in this body have been given authority over you. That nothing shall by any means harm me. Therefore, I command you, get out! Smite him. Leave. And just as you are walking on that road, no matter what you feel, start walking healed. Because, because of this, your spirit is a resurrected spirit. Start using that above your feelings. And start making action. Taking action. And see your body healed. How many, how many, of, you are, how many of you are already experiencing difference and results? Write in the comment section. Write it in the comment section. Remember the laws of war against the darkness. Smite. If God has given it into your hand, because remember, Jesus resurrected and then told John, I have the keys, which means by the law of sacrifice, even that is in your hands. Death and the grave is in your hands. Death and hell or death and the grave is in your hands, which means it is given into your hands. Smite him. Tell him leave. It is God. Remember, you start to walk with that. It is according to your will. That is the power of God in motion. So do not. That is the power of God in motion. So do not let anything else drive your will. Leventi says, Great pain yesterday till now I have no pain. Amen. And you shall have no more, sir. Yeah? For those of you who may be experiencing all kinds of different things for years, now is the time. Smite him. 
how, how do you smite him? Rebuke him. You know, like Jesus rebuked the devil? Rebuke it. As in, you don't say, I rebuke you. No, you don't rebuke a child by saying, I rebuke you. You, t- you rebuke the child by telling the child what to do. Get up. Sit. So that's rebuking. Stop that. That's rebuking. You don't say, I rebuke you. No, no, no. You don't tell a child that. If you rebuke the child like that, the child understand what you're saying. <laughs> right? And these things are serpents and scorpions. Commanded to leave. Rebuke it. And get up. And walk in the will of the resurrection. And write your results in the comment section. Tonight you're free. Is your will educated, yes or no? Then tonight you're free. Because it is God that is in you to will and to work His good pleasure. It is God's good pleasure by the sacrifice that you are healed. As a matter of fact, the definition of healing in the Bible is found in Exodus chapter 15. And it actually says that healing is that which is right in God's sight. Which means if you're not healed, God doesn't see that as right in His sight. It is, ev- it, is, it, is, it, is, it is evil in His sight. Therefore, make it right. You have the authority to make it right. Come on. Get up. Smite it. And even if, after tonight, it's not 100% gone, by some miracle, siege it. That's what you do. Now, for those of you who heard all of this for the first time, I'm encouraging you to revisit this video. I, we already created a Telegram group, and I will post the video within that Telegram group as well, so that you can actually encounter the list of everything that we're doing for healing. How many of you already? How many of you are actually free already? Seen results or and free, free, or, or have seen or, or have seen results already? Comment. The scriptures work. State the logical description. The scriptures work. It's very straight. Right? We already have what one person. Who else? Telegram name. I, I will actually post the the link in the comment section. All right? Leventi says he's free. Holy Sister Odile saying seen results. Come on. Do not. Do not. Listen to, listen to me. I'm going to read something for you from Deuteronomy 7. And we wrap it up on this one. Because I already have, I already have you all here longer than, than anticipated. Deuteronomy 7. Listen to this. Remember, we spoke about Deuteronomy yesterday and the promised land is like the new Jerusalem now. And the uncircumcised nations would be the darkness, the sickness, the infirmity, the devil's the darkness. When Yahweh thy Elohim shall bring thee into the land without thou goest to possess it, notice that the land, the promised land, is something that you're going to possess. Yeah? It's something that you're going to possess. The promised land, something you're going to possess, which means you don't sit down and say, in the name of Jesus, I'm healed. God will heal me. You're disrespecting the sacrifice. Possess it. Get up. Just like the example of me telling you, you're walking and something happening, you keep walking. Walk it strong. Walk the resurrection strong and see your body recover. Possess it. It says, when Yahweh thy Elohim shall bring thee into the land where thou goest to possess it, and had cast out many nations before thee, the Hittites and the Gagashites, the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, seven nations greater and mighty, greater and mighty than thou. And when when Yahweh thy Elohim shall deliver them before thee, isn't that delivered before you? Sit on my right hand until I, until I make. Your enemy is your footstool. The only enemy left is death. Speak from it. Speak to it from the, from, from, from the throne. Right? 
Listen to this. And when Yahweh the Elohim shall deliver them before thee, thou shalt smite them. Hear the instruction again. It was in Deuteronomy 20. We come back again to Deuteronomy 7. And it's saying, smite the darkness. Remember the word of the Lord is a sword, right? Okay. Smite them and utterly destroy them. That means that if you speak once, you don't see results? Say it again. If you don't see results, speak, rebuke it again. Utterly destroy it. Utterly destroy it. Psalm 118 says that the right hand of Yahweh is exalted. The right hand of Yahweh is valiant. Valiant means perceive, um, determined. Which means because you are exalted, because you are exalted, sitting on the throne, you're exalted already. Then you are valiant. Valiant means determined. That means you hit it until it, it, is, it is done. You could be valiant because the throne is sure and your dominion is an everlasting dominion. So he says, utterly destroy them, smite them and utterly destroy them. Next line. Thou shalt make no covenant with them nor show mercy unto them. Wait. It just said, smite, utterly destroy, make no covenant. Do you know that every time you sit down there and say God will heal you, after God has given you everything here, to possess it, and you say, God will heal you, and you sit down there, do you know that this right here is saying that you're making covenant with, 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 with darkness your complacency against that is making a covenant with death and darkness are we making covenants with, with death and darkness here yes or no write in the comment section <laughs> Are you making are you making covenant with the death of darkness here? No. You have one covenant, and that covenant is with Yahweh, is with Christ Yeshua. You have come into the covenant by accepting that Christ is in you. Which means speak to your body as Christ. Speak to the sickness as Christ. Smite it as Jesus. Don't speak it as as as, as Zane. Speak to your body as Christ because it is Christ in you, right? And just as Moses was told, say, I am Yahweh, then you could say, I am Christ. And we have covenant with the light. Exactly, brother. <laughs> exactly. So if the covenant and identity is Christ Jesus, you're, you're made righteous by just being Jesus. Speak to your body as Christ because it's Christ's spirit there. God, Moses spoke as Yahweh. Christ is now in you. You identify with Christ, the hope of glory, which is, which is the, the binding person of glory. Hope in, in Hebrew means to bind oneself with. So, to bind, sorry, when it means to bind with, it means to bind yourself to something. No matter what, until it comes to pass. Hope means to bind yourself to something, no matter what, until it comes to pass. Which means Christ in you. The one that you bind yourself to no matter what until you see glory. Speak to your body as Jesus. That is your covenantal identity. If you're not doing that, you're not functioning from your covenant. Pride and arrogance is taking on a name that God didn't give you. James said you are called by that name. Who calling you by that name? The Father, Yahweh is calling you by that name.
speak to your body as Christ, as Christ Yeshua, and smite the darkness. So no covenants with darkness, which means no complacency. Right? Neither shall thou make marriages with them. No big boy. Remember covenant and marriage? Paul used marriage to refer to the old covenant and the new covenant, right? Romans 7. To show you the difference in the covenant, he, speaks, he spoke about somebody who was married. And then the, the, the husband died. When the husband died, that person, that woman is free to go on to the new husband, which he identified as Christ. It was not meant to talk about marriage in person, for, in marriage dynamics. Speaking about covenantal shifting. So don't make don't make marriage with the darkness. Right? Thy thy daughter, thou shalt not give unto his son, nor his son shall not make unto his daughter. For they will turn away thy son from following thee, and that they, that they may serve other gods. Remember other gods other reference points. Right? So will the angle of, of the of Yahweh be kindled against you and destroy thee suddenly. See? Don't give complacency to the set to, 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 to the darkness and the darkness give the, give the darkness opportunity to destroy you suddenly. Destroy it. Utterly destroy it. You have to do it as Jesus Christ, exactly. Alright, and I think I could pause there for tonight, because we are already here late, late, later than expected. And so, I trust that this has actually educated your will. And know that it is God, it is you, it is God in you, to will and to work His good pleasure. We've educated your will. You are applying the will, your will of the resurrection. Your educated will of the resurrection. Applying that is putting the work of the power of God, the power of God to work is putting the power of God to work. Which is why some of you are experiencing healing already. Is this making sense? Type sense. Was this helpful to you tonight? Now, why is he responding? I just want to let you all know that we have already formed a Telegram community. I'm going to post the link to that Telegram community in the comment section of this video. And you can join that community where we'll be able to access all of this information. We had already also we already we also actually do coaching programs. And if you would like to purchase put a coaching program, we have a coaching program called Putting on the Name, where we introduce the name according to the ancient according to the to the, to the ancient priestly, prophetic and apostolic application of the name. We have a full coaching program called putting on the name we have right now I'm actually in the process of delivering one and for those of you who would like to purchase we actually have on sale right now the coaching program for what the name is how you put it on and I give you practical application to put it on just as we, I, I walk you through practical application here we have practical application to put it on and right now there is one that is not actually put up on our site as yet but we have it's actually already on telegram and so if you would like to purchase this discovers two things one in, one in particular is understanding what the name is how, how you apply it and reorientating your spiritual life according to the name yeah and we are also going to include reorientating your perspective concerning health according to the name if you would like to, to purchase the, these are these are the recording sessions, the recorded sessions that 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 we recorded, and we actually put them up for sale. Now, even though I like to give these things free of charge, um, ideally I would like to, but to do all that I am doing right here and everything that we do, we have overhead expenses as well as operational expenses. So the cost that comes with these things, in particular, actually help us to cover our expenses. If you're interested in purchasing those three components, that'll actually come up to about 12 sessions. That's 12 to, 12 to 18 sessions. 
Do you know what? I think that was 12 to 16. 12 to 16 sessions. We, um, those sessions in particular are one hour and a half and two hours each. Right? So it's a program that you can actually actually sit down and study, view it, understand it, and apply it and see results. If for those of you who are interested in purchasing that, that components of the program, there's actually just three components out of twelve components of the program. And we also educate persons in working out all nine gifts of the spirit. We're probably one of the only organizations that understand the nine gifts through the through the name of God, through its the cognitive law of God's name, and can actually train and activate persons in all nine. For those of you who would be interested in actually purchasing the, the, the first three components. There's these first three components. That's actually introduction to the name, reorientating your spirituality, and we're going to include, include reorientating your perspective of health so that you can walk in that. Please let me know. You can, reach, you can actually leave a comment or reach out to me in the inbox. And we, we already have it on Telegram, so we just add it to, to, to the Telegram community. And um, we actually right now giving it at, at just after actually doing this here tonight. For those of you who would like to jump into it, we are actually giving it at 50% off tonight for the next 24 hours. So for the first three to four persons, at least the first three to four persons, we are 50, uh, at 50% at, at off. Because at, these are 12 to 15 sessions, one, hour, one and a half to two hours each. That's 90 minutes, 120, 120 minutes. All right, where we, we are actually going to it extensively. For those of you who would like to actually learn more about what we are actually doing here, you can also join our Patreon community. Um, you can actually access podcasts, and we actually have another, we actually already have, we, are, we have a circle of communities online that's connected to our Patreon, to our Patreon platform. This group is our public group. We have other communities online that you can access where I actually give priority to, to questions as well as anything that you may have there in, uh, within those communities, and any questions that you have, anything that you like me to explain, anything that you like me to expound upon, we make available to you our over 50,000 hours of research, both into the pragmatic understanding of the ancient priestly perspective of the scriptures and we have coupled, we are probably one of the only organizations that coupled everything that we do with practical experimentation. This is the reason why I can explain this tonight in the way that, 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 that I can and also get you to begin to experience healing right here, right now. Because the scriptures work. Right? The only thing that is hindering the scriptures from working are doctrines that you have been taught that is contradicting. And it's because the power of God is flowing through your will most of you your will has been weakened by lies by conditions the name of Yahweh means self-existent and eternal which means it has to be it has to be taken on as your own and walked out as your will remember Jesus said not my will but your will be done his will would have been using an external reference points and saying father you could take this from me please but then he says, then he said, "Not my will, but your will be done." Just as you, just as I explained tonight, he understood the dynamics of the scriptures, and the reason why it had to be done. The writer of Hebrews actually attributes Jesus's persecution. He attributes Jesus's persecution to Jesus maintaining discipline under pressure. His will, he maintained the will of the Father. And drift, just as, as the example of you walking down that road. No matter what happened, Jesus took all of that and maintained the will of the Father. And, it's, and the writer says, if he could do that, to that extent, you have not shed blood as yet. You have not shed blood. So it should be easy for you to do. And all we need to do is to identify all of the things that you were taught that are not right. That has nothing to do with the Bible. So if you'd like to, if you'd like more information concerning our Patreon platform, you can always visit www.patreon.com forward slash zine 
Z-A-N-E underscore E-L underscore F-U-E-G-O Zane underscore L underscore Fuego You can always check the featured section in our community for that link um, We have option We have we have the the Shine and Star option where you, where you can access Bible study mentorship a, a library of Bible study mentorship pr um, sessions all or one and a half to two hour sessions so that you can take your time and learn and remove all of these perspectives that you've had. We also provide you with a podcast that actually shows you how to take the cognitive law of God's name and apply it to your daily life and to your personal life. And if you'd like to take it further and actually understand the Bible, then you can become a spiritual goal patron. And um, as a spiritual goal patron, we access another podcast, which is an educational podcast, where I take you through the Gospel of John. We're right now, we're on chapter 15, going into chapter 16 on the Gospel of John. And we have over 600 episodes of that podcast, actually 700. So you have enough to actually sit down and absorb to see and change your mind so that you could walk out the scriptures through the ancient priestly, prophetic, and apostolic understanding of it and abandon the perspectives of westernized Christianity, this Greek or Roman Christianity that we have been taught. It yields no power. If you have now joined this community, you may not know that this institute in particular counts now logs 50,000 hours of research and experiments. And the first two years, I'm a translator by profession, a professional translator. And so the, 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 the content benefited from my knowledge of the science of translation. After going through 11 versions of the Bible personally, I'm actually, uh, we actually found our answers in really understanding the philosophy of the ancient Hebrew language to be able to understand, to then identify the principle of God's name, to see it as a law of, 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 of uh, a cognitive law and to understand that his name is actually a role that he's playing. A way of seeing things, a way of understanding things, to be able to unpack the Bible in the way that we have, to be able to reproduce what we're reproducing here with you. All right, so for those of you in particular who would like to just take your time and move along, then you can actually become a spiritual goal or consider the Shining Star option. And for those of you who would like to purchase a coaching program, now, this is, a 12, this, is actually, this is actually a 12 section program. These are just three, the first three in particular. Um, the first three in particular is where we take the name as a cognitive law and apply it to these areas. Right? So you're looking at 12 to, 15 sessions, 12 to 16 sessions, multiply by two. So that's about 30 hours of unpacking of those things and I show you how to practically stop grappling and people understand all of the external reference points invalidate it and then educate yourself on the name the perspective of the name concerning your spirituality concerning your health and then create a framework this is something that we in the western world do not understand most of you were taught Christ as a moral compass you were taught to accept Christ, continue living your life and try to live like him. That is not covered, that is not biblical spirituality. Biblical spirituality is covenantal. See how you would actually go and sign up for in university. And if you sign up in university tonight to, to, to study a course, you have a life adjustment. Your university schedule becomes a priority and your life is scheduled around that this is how covenant life works and that's why you're struggling in most cases to see results or to see it is to, to, to experience god because you are actually taught that whilst covenantal life is that you come into covenant and you make christ the center of your life and your life is structured around what you have decided to do to walk out the covenant every believer once you come into covenant with christ every believer is supposed to take on one one prophecy at least to fulfill into the earth you see jesus doing that by going to isaiah 61 you see paul doing that 
in Romans 15 where he says that he will go where it was not prophesied and he said he used those prophecies as his life's principle his life's goal which means when you come into the covenant you become a priest immediately and Isaiah 61 are your marching orders that's the priestly anointing and with this understanding that you have here tonight you could go and command any devil of any you come into the covenantal identity of Jesus Christ and you approach that person as Jesus and you drive that devil off of that person and they will be healed I am not asking you go test it go test it your covenant works and tonight all we did was actually clarify why it works by the law of sacrifice and so you have the ability to get it off of you and now you can go to put the persons and smite the darkness off of that person see what I'm saying so your covenant requires that you come in and you make Christ if whether you start with understanding script your Bible study you make that your priority and you schedule your life around that and you start to fulfill the prophecies that God put into your heart to fulfill some of you are God is already speaking to you and some of the things that you're feeling in your heart is actually written in the prophecies just identify the prophecy and make it your life's goal and voila now you're walking in spirit every day because your life will now be tailored to help you fulfill that prophecy that's how you become one with Christ you become one with his objectives and his objective is to establish the mighty nation of Abraham on the earth for centuries you've been taught that you, you accept Christ and not go to hell hell has been misconstrued in so many different ways I said I said in the PhD session on last Wednesday that is that the writer of Hebrews said that the same gospel that we have today was preached in the wilderness and he's telling us today to do not harden our hearts as them, as them in the wilderness. Their gospel in the wilderness was that they were going to the promised land. We somehow allow hell to become the priority of the gospel. It was never the priority of the gospel. Abraham's promise was supposed to be fulfilled, which is the mighty nation of Abraham on the earth. Which is what Jesus fulfills in the New Jerusalem. And you, coming into the covenant, have come in to heaven. None of you here should be saying that you live on earth. If you're in covenant, you live in heaven. And you are Yeshua walking in a body. And all the other believers around you are angels. Because Yeshua, being driven by Christ, can also be identified in the same. The Messiah. If the Messiah is in you, then Yeshua is walking the earth through you in heaven and your dominion is an everlasting dominion so smite the darkness it has no right in heaven everybody else may be living out of heaven but from the time you come into the covenant you live in the new Jerusalem and it is our responsibility as believers to establish the nation this is why Paul went around forming communities in different spaces because what he was doing was building communities that would come together to form the city so that just in the Old Testament Abraham stands on the plains of Mamre and these, eight, these three men were actually priests they were Enosh but when they translated it they said men it was actually three Enosh Enosh were priests of the name the one who identified as Yahweh was called the judge of all the earth that's the high priest the assistant priests were called angels because they're seeing themselves in their covenant why is everybody will see priests to them they're in covenant and they see things according to the covenant but those priests were the priests who would walk around and come down off of the mountain that they were living on to see what's taking place and, and establish justice in the earth righteousness and equity righteousness and justice integrity and equity in the earth this is why the ecclesia the, the church exists to be those guys establishing righteousness in the earth but everybody's still playing church in, West, in the Greek-Roman world 
everybody trying to just go and raise their hands and say praise god when you are supposed to be the regulator of justice on the earth the representatives of the king the king that is in you and the king that is on his throne in the highest with the name that is above all names that's another reason why you have authority over even sickness disease and infirmities because that's a name and you have a name that is above all names which means your name is above them and just like the sun shines and gives fills all things with its spirit fills the earth with warmth it fills the seas with 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 with, with, with warmth it fills metal with heat it fills plants with life you have a name above all names and you have the ability to bring all of this into obedience you have been lied to and this is your wake-up call healing is just one small part of it you're supposed to be governing the creation start manifesting so on that note i'm actually way i three hours here way i just want to shout out everybody that actually joined well, two hours and 54 minutes shout out to sybil Kavan kavanagh blessings and much love nancy Nap holy sister nancy napier bless blessings much love holy sister odelia holy brother leventi tilika blessings and much love Holy Sister Monica Poyton, blessings much love. Bless Holy Brother No One Pigeon, blessings and much love. Holy Sister Tonya, blessings, much love. These names kind of repeated here. I don't see anybody new. Christopher Burton, blessings and much love, Holy Brother. Trust at all as well. Alright, so for those of you in particular who are interested in the coaching program, kindly reach, just message me, inbox me, and we actually give it to you 50% off tonight for the next 24 hours. Right? We, we, the only thing that we really charge for is the coaching programs, really, and um, coaching, coaching, coaching classes. These sessions are free, as you see. Holy Sister Sanda Pop, Holy Sister Rashida Kai Ke, blessings and much love. Holy Sister Michelle Kalnan, blessings, much love. I'm making sure I meet anybody, right? Miss anybody. Holy Brother Israel John Massey, blessings and much love. Holy Brother Telvin Jeffries was in the house, blessings and much love. I don't know if he's still there. Holy Sister Grace the Amaral, of course. I can't miss you. <laughs> blessings, much love. Holy Sister Patty Sutton, blessings and much love. I think that should be it there, right? Holy Sister Tammy, blessings and much love to you. All right, so for those of you who are actually, and Holy Sister Shannon Rarig, blessings and much love. So for those of you in particular, for those of you who, who would like to purchase the package, we would actually put you on Telegram. And on the, any Telegram community, you can actually ask questions and I will respond to those questions with the, with the purchase of the package. I'll actually maintain um you would actually have my attention to answer questions for up to for up to uh, three three months i maintain presence there so you can ask questions as as you right so for 12 weeks you can ask questions and when we actually trans could we're going to transcribe those sessions those are live coaching sessions raw there's nothing taken out of it you're getting everything as it, as it actually was spoken when we transcribe it, you'll also receive a copy of we're going to take that and put out and put these things into books. And once we have the, transcri the transcription, you'll also receive that free of charge. All right. So on that note, have a pleasant night, everyone. Let me just make sure. Yeah. I'm seeing one person saying here, I want to purchase the coaching session and I want to study study the Bible. All right. Just message me, Sybil. Education of my someone tonight. All right.
Okay. Nice. So, I shall see you all soon. All right. Um, to, I will not be live tomorrow night. We'll be live on Tuesday night with the session four of the Priest and Healing and Deliverance training. That's at 8 p.m. East Eastern Time. So, see you then. Blessings and much love. Boom. Yeshua. Yeah, sure.